Yeah, appreciate every, everyone tuning in. Obviously, appreciate you uh, being a part of this, Leslie. Yes, um, really excited to to just join everybody today um, and really just have a conversation. Uh, we, you know, been launching a platform around um, creating separation and you know everything that goes into you know differentiating yourself from from a mental standpoint, from a growth mindset standpoint, and really an approach and, and just a general way that you that you look at at the world and and that different perspective and um you know as, as i launched this platform i couldn't think of anybody better to to have on as, as a first guest uh, my man leslie uh, i've known leslie since shoot 2008 2009 um, yes, he's he was kind of my entry point into into the media world he's become a really good friend and mentor ever since um you probably seen Leslie's name rolling on on the credits of some of some of the movies and and specifically in the comedy industry. Um, he's he's been a guy that's just kind of been behind the scenes by design, but uh, really making some 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 major moves. And uh, well, welcome, Leslie, man. Welcome to the platform, man. Thank you, sir, Mister Colston, Mister <laughs> uh, uh, MC Twelve. <laughs> What's going down? Nothing much, man. Nothing much. Um, no, we just kind of kind of get right into it, man. Uh, we, we spoke the other day just a, around creating this platform, and uh, you're somebody that obviously you you really you know made your mark in, in the film industry. Um, just kind of, if you wouldn't mind, just just kind of giving everybody a feel for it. one. How how did you really get into the industry, and um, you know, did you always know that was in the cards for you? Well, let me let, let me let me go back just a little bit. So for me, um, I grew up in a world. My father was a sharecropper. Mm-hmm. Um, he essentially was raised like a slave. Um, he got up in the morning at seven years old, went to the fields, worked the fields, went to school, came back from school, went back and worked the fields. Mm-hmm. Fourteen kids lived in a three bedroom shotgun house. Right. And so living in a place called Carthage, Texas, there was a lot of racism and stuff that you know was around when he was growing up. Mm-hmm. And so he decided that he didn't want to raise his kids there. So he moved to Los Angeles and, um, and that's where he had his family. So, you know, I grew up with a mentality of being taught to me that you had to get a job. You know, you had no sort of perspective, no place in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, your voice didn't matter because that's the way he was raised. Right. And, and and we don't fault him for that. It was just the way he was raised, right. you know. Um, but I had the wonderful opportunity to have interaction with some very great people. Um, we were musicians, and so we started a little house band. And cats like Marvin Gaye, Barry White, and all these great Maurice White would come around, hear us playing, and they would stop and say, y'all doing this wrong. Let me show you how to do this, or let me show you how to do that. Then they would invite us up to their houses and say, hey, look, come on up here. You know, don't get on the streets. Don't do nothing wrong. You can come here and learn. So I used to go up into their houses and sit and watch these cats recording and writing and working. And the thing I took from that is they worked really hard and long out. Mm-hmm. You know, quite naturally, they were geniuses from a talent perspective. But more importantly, they didn't just rely on their talent. Their work ethic was everything. Um, the other thing was is they had a tremendous world perspective. You know, they, they, they thought about the world we lived in. They were concerned about how people lived, how communities worked, and those things. And so that motivated me to get an education, to go mm-hmm. get my edu- education. Um, and as I was working in that world of, you know, pursuing college, um, they also offered me opportunities in, in, in the entertainment industry. I started shooting music videos and that kind of stuff back in the 90s. And then from there, you know, I got into doing uh, documentaries, films, comedy concerts, the whole thing. Uh, 2003, I opened up my own production company because I saw the value in not only uh, doing the work, setting up a business, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective to go forth and, and actually house these productions. Um, and then quite naturally that forced me to really understand economics, you know, balance sheets, business, um, you know, uh, accounts receivables, payables, you know, you had to get all of that more importantly, then you had to structure, uh, put together staffing and all of those things in order to make the company operation work. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, a lot of my experience comes from hands-on, you know, producing and, and making things work. Um, and so we've had some success from the commercial perspective, meaning that we've done some projects and worked with some people that have been very successful. But at the same time, we've been able to maintain, you know, and, and, and design a model of production that also is, 
effective from a business perspective. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point you make, um, you know, just being able to learn, you know, hands on and really just kind of going through it. Um, that that was really, you know, obviously that's how you that's how you become a professional athlete. You got to You got to go through the fire and you got to, you know, continue to. Honestly, you gotta you gotta outwork everybody and and hope that, that you know a couple things fall in your favor. Um, but as I as I made the jump in entrepreneurship, it was a really similar situation. Um, just really jumping into an opportunity that I was learning on the fly. And the interesting thing was, as I was as I was in that venture, I decided to try and go back to business school at the same time. And to to your point, I learned more just kind of getting beat up. Just trying to trying to work my way through um, every aspect of the business than I actually learned in business school, and um, you know I ended up that that kind of became my 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 MBA on the fly. So um, it's really interesting just to kind of hear your perspective in, in a similar way and knowing the strides that you've made and really knowing where you are today and kind of you know your your point of origin you know within the business. Uh, just really interesting to me. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, there's something to, uh, one of the things when I was in graduate school, I had a professor, a guy who was over my dissertation, his name was Dr. Edward Blakely. And he, while he saw some value in, in, in classroom education, his perspective was you had to be out there doing it, you know, and I studied economics with an emphasis in development. Mm -hmm. And so he would, we would go to different countries and work on economic forecasting and planning and all this other stuff. And we were constantly every semester we were going out into the world and doing something and to me that that learning is what i remember i could right. remember very little of what i learned in class but the stuff that we learn when we we're in beijing or when we we're in hanoi vietnam mm -hmm. you know working on different plans and stuff like that that's the stuff that stuck with me and that's the stuff that i still use today right, right. the idea of being able to talk to people that come from a cultural different cultural background you know, to go in and do a critical analysis of someone in their own culture and learn how to respect and understand their customs and their morals. All of that stuff I learned in that environment. Had I not had that experience, I don't think the success would be there. No, I mean, it, that, that context is everything. I mean, I, I, you can learn the rules of the game. That's one thing. But learning how to play the game is a totally different Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, man. So so um, you kind of you kind of find your way into into the film industry and um like i said we crossed paths back in in 2009 um working on a project and i, I it, it's funny i knew nothing about media i knew nothing about film um you know come across you and and find somebody that's first and foremost just a good dude um you know about empowering young people but um you just kind of became a wealth of knowledge and you you probably don't know this but but you really became a mentor for for me as somebody that was, uh, you know, really looking at the media industry as something I was potentially interested in, um, but also just just somebody that uh, you know just had that that wider perspective of of what we can do, you know, as 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 black men and what we can do um, with the platforms that we've been given and, and work our butts off to create. Um, so first and foremost, I, I don't know if I ever told you that, but I, I really no, you appreciate. Didn't. I appreciate hearing that. Though. <laughs> No, I really appreciate it. You know, just just you being somebody that I can I can look to as a mentor. Um, so, just kind of kind of shifting gears a bit. Um, you know, so we're we're in the middle of this this global pandemic, and you know, it's wreaking have it's wreaked havoc on every single corner of the market. Uh, every single industry has been hit some form or fashion. Um, I can only imagine, you know, with, with you being in the film industry, what what it's done to you guys. Um, kind of walk me through, you know, what, what is it, what looks different for you guys and, and you in particular, and uh, like, how are you really navigating, you know, through these times? You know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of what we do is so personal, like it's in contact, right? When you're on a production set, you know, there's hundreds of people rolling around. Everybody has to talk to you. In my capacity as a director, there may be 50, 60 people every day that have three questions for me, right? And they want to come up and talk, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, you know, it's created a change. Now, right now, we're not we're not able to work. We still, you know, we, we're not in production. Um, but now we're starting to do things with, with like Zoom um, mm -hmm. and, and, and doing cell phone stuff where we were starting to create programs and productions that, you know, we're starting to envision. 
I think any problem, I think it goes back to this sort of thing that I learned when I was in college. And that was, you know, the, the hardest thing about solving the most difficult problem is figuring out how to look at it. Right. You know, a lot of times problems arise and people just take the same lens and look at it the same way. And when the solution is not there, they think it's non-solvable. But we were trained to go 360 degrees around a problem and figure out a different angle. You know, so this situation now is forcing us to just look at it differently. A lot of people will fall away because they're, they're functionally fixed, right? They, right? they only have one way to function, one way to look at it. But as you know, in football, as a professional athlete, you got to figure out how to get open. No <laughs> and sometimes, you know, week to week, that's a different thing, right? So you have the practice, you're trained to figure out different ways to solve your problem. And that's what we have to do now. You know, we got to take that note from professional athletes. And that's what we're doing now. We're saying, how do we look at this? You know, you know, are we going to do a quarantine studio? Meaning that, you know, when we go to shoot a project, everybody comes in, they check in, they get tested, and they don't leave until it's done. Mm-hmm. Um, are we going to do remote? You know, I was uh, in New York shooting a film, and I had to shoot a show in, in, in Oakland, and I did it by remote, you know, because I couldn't get from Oakland to New York. Mm-hmm. So at this point, we're not doing anything yet because of the physical production. is just not possible with the regulations. But as they start to loosen... I think I want to be very careful and start to figure out ways to reduce the possibility or the probability of people getting sick. So Mm -hmm. it's going to take a different aspect in production and looking at ways to do it where people can feel as safe as possible. Right. Definitely. No, I think that that growth mindset that you touched on, man, I mean, it's it's huge. And I think, um, again, I I think it it comes back to the way that that you learn and the, the way that you got into the business. If it's, you know, something that's a little more experiential, you, you have that context and you have that um, that peripheral awareness, right? You you um, If you're kind of coming into it with that fixed mindset, you only know one way to do it is by the book. And if you kind of get thrown off your game, um, it's, it's, it's a whole different, it's a whole different scenario versus when you kind of learn your way and you find your way to solutions, um, it's, it's almost just as valuable to learn how not to do something than it is to yes. learn to how to do something, and you know through those 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 small um, those small failures or those small lessons, it kind of gives you a wider scope that you can kind of you can view the world, you can view problem solving from, and you're a hundred percent right, especially playing playing the receiver position, like that was that was my world, right? I, I would I would get a playbook every week and it had you know lines on it. I run three steps and go at a forty five degree angle. What, what that playbook doesn't show you is that here you got a guy that, that's faster than you, got quicker feet than you, that's, he doesn't want you to get off the line. And there you got, you know, at the end of that angle, it's a 250-pound linebacker ready to take your head off. And you got a small space to navigate within. So the difference between that, that you know, that 45-degree angle on a paper and what it actually looks like to execute it on the field is totally different. And it's all a matter of, that that peripheral awareness that you talked about so um yeah it's just, it's just really interesting how um the way that you come in and the way that you create your experiences really leads to how you solve the most complex problems there you go um kind of kind of along those lines so knowing a little bit more about your background how you got into the film game what what is it about what is it about you as an individual that has allowed you to come in and really carve out your own space in your own lane within an industry that, you know, traditionally hasn't represented us very well? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, having, you know, I, have, I was having this discussion with some, 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 some guys the other day. And, you know, one of my big motivations in the film industry was, and it goes back to when I was in graduate school, because we did a lot of work in different countries Mm -hmm. and we traveled a lot, there was a narrative out there about black men that preexisted my coming to a, to a place. Mm -hmm. So when I would go to a small village or, you know, a small town, they had this idea that I was this kind of guy, whether I was some violent guy or some drug dealer or some, Mm -hmm. you know, there was this narrative, right, right. That, that was there and that bothered me. And, and, and so I'd have to spend, few days sort of getting to know people, re-articulating myself and setting up or changing, transforming that narrative so that we could get the work done, right? Mm -hmm. There were people that actually were scared of me 
and had never even met me because I had, you know, because I was black. Mm -hmm. um, there were other people that would touch my skin and would want to know if it was rubbing off because it didn't seem normal to them. So mm -hmm. I was saying to myself, you know, somebody's been out in this globe telling a story about me, about us, about us as African-American men that have nothing to do with us. And so part of my motivation first was to change that narrative. Mm -hmm. One of the things about going into films was, you know, being able to make stories, to tell stories that really reflected who we were from a holistic perspective and not some sort of stereotypical, you know what I mean, fringe mm -hmm. thing. So that's the first thing. That was a that was a huge motivation. And that still is the journey. Right. The goal is to sort of, you know, retell our stories. Um, the, 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 the second thing becomes is I just think and, and you can attest to this, that you got to be great at something, you know, like you. You know, when you walk into the room, you are your asset, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're really good at something, when you're great at something, then the ability to be effective or to be productive is undeniable. Right. You know, uh, 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 I'm thinking of his name. James Baldwin wrote a book, and in it, it was a, a letter to his nephew, and it's and he's and his favorite line that I've always remembered was, "Never make peace with mediocrity," right? You know, and so part of my journey has always been to become really focused. Um, and, and become great at what I'm doing. And when I mean by great, that's not like an exterior analysis, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of an internal analysis, right? right? I need to feel like I put in the work to feel great about what I'm doing so that I can have the confidence, right, to convince you that I'm great at what I'm doing. Right. Um, your perspective of what I'm doing may be different, but my internal resolve is that I'm great. There, I might not be the best, but there's no better, Right. Um, and that is the energy that I think is necessary in any competitive environment to move forward. No, no doubt about it, man. And it's um, it. The thing about that, that mentality and that mindset is, is uh, it can't be hollow. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, this better than most. Um, it's one thing to have that internal feeling, but it's another thing for it to be built on a foundation of, you know, that nobody's outworking. You, you know, that right. nobody's out prepared you. And you know that you're going to walk into every situation. You might not have the solution, but you know you put in enough work to where you can be agile enough and quick enough on your feet to figure out the solution faster than everybody else. Um, and like that level of preparation is what allows you to walk into the room with that level of confidence, no doubt. Yeah, I used to love that, that, that hearing when I would come around athletic environments, they'd say, trust your training. Right. Yep. So that if you train hard enough in the right way, just trust that. And it's going to see you through whatever problem you got. Oh, I, I, I picked that up from you guys. Trust your training. I tell people that on set all the time. Trust your training, man. Let's go. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a saying like they, they pay you to practice. I, I play the games for free. You pay me to practice because <laughs> that's, that's where the grind is. Because yeah. um, it's, it's you can throw as many, you know, sports cliches out there as you want. But the reality is that iron sharpens iron. And, you know, if you're not all if you're not continually stretching yourself to a place um, that makes you expand, then, I mean, you're, you're not you're, you're kidding yourself. You're not making yourself better. Um, you know, so there's, there's there's no comfort in being great. Like, there's, there's, you know, and, and, you know, I sort of added to that iron sharpens iron. I also believe that if you take iron and you and you rub it against a, a lesser quality metal, mm -hmm. they both become weaker. Mm. Right. And so not only does iron sharpen iron, but then the opposite of it is true, too. So you not only need to be around iron, but you got to be careful that you're not, you know, uh, 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 rubbing off with people right. who make you dull or, you know, you know, reduce your effectiveness. Right. That's that's a good point, man. Um, no, man. So so, you know, we we kind of are, are hinting around this this idea of, of what it what it means to to create separation. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, just hearing your journey, hearing, you know, how you got into this point and, and really hearing that I can hear it in your voice and in your spirit that you're not close to being done yet. No, not even, I'm, I feel <laughs> like I'm just getting started. <laughs> yeah. And that's, Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it, man. Once you, once you get it going, I mean, that, that momentum never stops. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you, what what's uh what's occupying you know your your time and your your what's your what's your new ambition or, or, or obsession that that you got going on? You know, I'm 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 really focusing on just like you know uh, transformation, you know, uh, of myself. You know, I think that part of I think that you know we constantly work on 
our language, our ability to speak, our mm -hmm. ability to present ourselves. But the other thing is, 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 is also getting to know who you are, right? And as time goes on, we sort of change, right? So this time has allowed me to sort of really do an introspective perspective, just go in and start to think and look at myself, right? And say, you know, from a conscious perspective, what am I doing, right? What am right. I about, like the statements and the things and what's really important, you know? So this is a wonderful time for me because I literally have had the sort of serenity to just sit back and just really focus and rethink um, and just think about productivity from the perspective of, am I creating life with the people that I'm touching, right? Mm. You know, when, you, when I come into your environment, is it bringing in an energy that uplifts and moves you forward mm. or is it one that is taking you down, right? And that's, that to me is really important at this point, right? Because this virus is teaching us, right, that you can come in contact with people and the very contact with them can kill you, right? Mm -hmm. That's a physical thing. But from a metaphorical perspective, it's forced me to go a little higher and say, well, when I come into contact with you, am I helping you? You know, is my contact, my energy with you? Even if you're working at a hotel, right, and I come in to check in, can I say a nice word that improves your day, right? right? Can I make that interaction just as effective, right? And that's sort of where I'm at right now along with, because I think that's going to help in my creativity mm -hmm. in my life is to become a better person. So I'm really looking at that, that energy. What's the energy that is coming from my being? You know, that's really important at this point. No, that's, I mean, that's, that's deep. Um, yeah. I mean, just from a, from a reciprocity standpoint, man, you, 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 the energy that you want to receive is the energy that, that you need to put out. And you're a hundred percent right. Like this, this, this virus, I mean, you have the you have the perspective um, that that you that you that you have at that point, right? So I think we we all know and understand that that it's it's affecting people in different ways. It's affecting businesses in different ways and families. Um, but from from similar to you, the position that I sit in and, and being blessed to to be able to take this perspective and really understand. Um, that this is is a time of, of introspection, self reflection, and just the ability uh, for someone that's really moved around for for the last ten or fifteen years at a at a rate of speed that I had no idea I was moving at right. um, to be forced to to really sit down and spend time and be present with my family. Um, that's been that's been a game changer for me, and it's it's really that perspective becoming more have a priority and moving to the forefront has really made me shift my priorities on the business front. And um, to be honest with you, that's part of the reason why this platform on a personal level, I'm, I'm launching it now because, um, you know, you, you move around and you meet good people. Um, but you at some times, especially being an athlete, you feel like those interactions are hollow at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's experiences, um, you know, whether they be life experiences, business experiences, um, you always feel that that fan connection and you always feel like there's a younger generation that looks to you for inspiration, um, you know, as an athlete. But the platform should be and can be way more robust than that. And the ability to really use this platform, um, you know, to to be an inspiration and show the 360 degree view of what you can be as, as a human and as a business person and, and as a philanthropist and all these things. Um, it's become really important to me um, to, to, to show that, that diversity, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, and you saw it growing up probably the same way I did. There, there were only certain roles that, that you saw as, as potential endpoints for you until you get to a place or someone helps you break through that point, break through that glass ceiling. And now you can see the world from a completely different perspective. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really helped me to accelerate this thought process of how do I continue to use this platform to help other people um, to your point, create those, those positive interactions that, you know, leaves positivity um, that's meaningful as opposed to, you know, a hollow and an autograph and yeah, a pre, appreciate the fact that you're a fan of, of my craft and what I did for a living. Um, but how can we create more valuable interactions between each other? I mean, that's, that's, that's a big thing. Well, you know, to your point, it's interesting because I've been, I've thought about this idea a lot of when you start, like, even when you talk about like, you know, 
coming up is these barriers, right? There's only these certain roads of, of, of where you can enter into. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I've come to realize is that that's a social agreement. And for those barriers to exist, we sort of have to agree that they exist. Right. right? You know what I mean? And once I agree in my mind, once I sort of, uh, 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 you know, believe that these barriers exist, then I stop myself. Mm. I don't, you know, whether the barrier is there or not, it's there. It's psychological, right? And then you start to find out, and I started to find out that as I pushed, as I believed that there was no barriers, as I, I, as I refused to be a participant in that social construct, those barriers just went away, right? And they went away because part of it is what you said, preparation, having value, having mm -hmm. substance, and then moving forward, right? Um, and so the more, and, and that's not to say that the barriers are not there. That's to say that the only way to break through a wall is you got to believe you can break through the wall. Right. You know what I mean? If you're going to run into the wall and don't believe you can break <laughs> through it, it's going to knock you down every time. Right? right. And so at some point in your mind, you got to say that barrier is not strong enough to stop me from getting through. Mm. This is what I'm saying. Right. And that profound thing comes from, you know, athletes like they do that every day of their life. You know, somebody's putting up a wall and saying, you know, you've got to believe as Marcus Colson, I can get through it. Right. Right. And so, Part of that has been, and we talk about this, I'm saying that we've got to stop agreeing that the wall is stronger than us, mm. you know, and we've got to, we've got to transform. When I talk about transforming one's consciousness, the transformation is that I'm breaking through the wall and it can't stop. Right. You know what I mean? Then your options are limitless. No, I mean, that's, that's, um, honestly, that, that is, that is entrepreneurship. Um, hundred percent. In, in a nutshell, I mean, that that the the entrepreneurs that are able to break through and the business owners that are able to break through do have that belief in, you know, their ability to break through the wall. And ultimately, there are only going to be so many ideas that can be created. Yeah. Right. It, it really boils down to what what kind of internal drive do you have to um, do it better, do it more efficiently. Um, but also take on the water, um, you know, take on the adversity and what do you have internally to, to see it all the way through to the other side? Um, and that, that's, that kind of was, was the connection point and that was a connectivity to entrepreneurship for me, you know, being a professional athlete. Um, I mean, my, my story is, I, I, I talk about it all the time, you know, as, as a, you know, under recruited high school athlete, you go to Hofstra, which is not Alabama or LSU, clearly. Um, <laughs> seventh round pick, and and you know you understand the odds. There's a one percent chance I was probably going to be on a roster for for a year or two, and you know ten years later I was able to have the career that I had. And it wasn't because I was physically just better than everyone else. Um, it was to your point. I personally believed that the wall in front of me wasn't. It wasn't going to stop me. And there was no odds. There was no expert that would, you know, tell me and put a model together that could capture how hard I was willing to work, um, how how quickly and how much dedication I would take <clears throat> to to learn the playbook and get myself into a position where I can contribute in any particular place at any particular time on the field. Like those are those are the intangibles that you can't you can't factor into a ratio or, or a mathematical model. Like those are the variables and the intangibles. And ultimately those are the same things that make entrepreneurs successful at the end of the day. Um, yes. so I think that's um, as as you as you kind of move forward, I know um, you kind of touched on some of the some of the things that you guys are thinking about from from the you know from a film industry perspective. Um, how do you see as an individual? How do you see yourself kind of pivoting and trying to navigate um, this unknown you know territory that we're about to walk into? You know, I think you got to You know, for me, I've been studying a lot about you know you know the history of viruses and you know and this virus and, you know, the whole COVID virus issue, right? And I've also looked at in great detail past calamities like this, 
Mm-hmm. And so part of it first is it's just to become aware, right? You can't create solutions until you become aware of it. Um, and and I'm, I'm really clear, I think, on that, that these things are very serious, you know, um, and we've got to take them very seriously, you know. Um, and so having said that, you know, we are not, I'm now formulating in my mind different models of production. You know, are there different ways to do what we've been doing for a long time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and utilizing this as a given, like in geometry, given COVID virus, it's real, it's there. Right. You know, so using that as a backdrop to build out the rest of the formula for existence, you know? Um, and, and I don't have the answers, but I, that's what my mindset is, right? Mm-hmm. And I think even as we get closer to probably going back to production, it's going to become more clear. But it's clearly something you can't ignore. Right. We can't act like because people are feeling better or there, it's a better weather or something like that, that this threat is not there. Right. And so, you know, I just don't want to be, you know, become passive in this. You know, this is a reality and it's going to change how we function, mm-hmm. um, but it's OK to change. The question just becomes is, you know, are we going to be in a position to control it? So I'm doing a lot of thinking about it and, um, you know, and and being very diligent. Um, but it's definitely going to change how we do things, right? And we're, and we're really, it's probably going to change the scope of how we do things. Like, you know, you might make a movie or do a film or a television show that has, you know, 15 different sets or something like that. That might become three, right? There's going right. to just be different ways of how we envision this stuff working. Right. Um, and creatively, you know, we go through a long creative process before we get into physical production anyway. So as we get into those creative processes, I'm going to start to, implement those kinds of things. Uh, Mm -hmm. But those conversations are happening a lot right now as we speak. Yeah, I can imagine just just kind of having a chance to look under the hood a little bit and and see really what goes into a production and, you know, post uh, pre production, post production and everything in between. Um, Yeah, there's so many different moving parts. Um, Yeah, definitely, definitely gonna have to kind of keep tabs and, and see how, how this thing continues to evolve because, you know, from, from a, from an operational standpoint, um, I can, I can envision there being scenarios where, you know, there, there are things that have had to move com- to completely digital, you know, within this last three weeks yes. and, um, people have, have, you know, figured out that, you know, there's some efficiency here. Um, you know, there there are some other businesses that are that are more physical physical touch and, and you know uh, local regional businesses that are going to have challenges, um, and everyone's going to have challenges in different ways. Um, I think part of what I'm anxious to see is is how how businesses um, are able to to adopt a more digital first mindset, and you know kind of use this as as a as a way to you know jump start innovation that's probably been sitting on the back burner or kind of right there in front of them um this whole time well, you know and the other thing I, I think in our in our industry a different palette is being developed as well you know you know at the upper age level right a lot of kids have already been consuming their entertainment on computers their phones right. you know ipads stuff like that but i think now over a couple of months of theaters being shut down, live entertainment venues being shut down, you know, we are now consuming our entertainment again, like whether it's Netflix or whatever, we're, we're, we're consuming our entertainment differently. Um, for instance, we did a movie a couple of years ago, it was supposed to come out this summer, it's called Two Minutes of Fame, and they just announced they're going to put it out on HBO, where it was originally made for theaters, but that business seems like it's going to be very slow to come back around. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, film companies can't afford to just sit with these films, you know, in their vaults, so... You know, it's a HBO release. So, you know, so I think you're going to start seeing more of the cable streaming services start to come alive mm-hmm. because, you know, we've now have a palette for saying, yeah, I'd like to sit in my living room with my son and sit and, you know, in the comfort of our house and, and consume, you know, information. So part mm-hmm. of that goes into the to what we're talking about as well. It's like, you know, uh, there is definitely a different palette. So a different sort of, um, you know, requirement is going to come about. You know, people are wanting things differently. So that's what I'm saying. There's going to be a lot of change mm-hmm. and some reshuffling because, you know, uh, people are going to want to consume things probably perceived in a more safer environment, right? right. It's safe for me to be at home. Right. You know, I don't know how that's going to affect the sports world, but we do know 
that 60% of, you know, our revenues in television comes from sports entertainment. Right. It's the number one revenue provider and driver in the world right. when it comes to television. So now, you know, how does that, how is that going to look, right? Yeah. Um, what you guys do support <clears throat> what we do. Without sports, you know, what we do doesn't exist because, you know, you guys generate the revenue that allows us to do what we do. So it's, it's a big issue. Yeah, I mean that's that's a really good point. I mean, there, there's so many there's so many of these these complementary businesses that that kind of hinge on one another to to create ultimate success. And I mean, the sports leagues it, it's been a race to get to digital for a while. Um, you know, with these leagues, anyways. I mean, you you've kind of got the the more linear TV deals, the the CBS deals, and uh, the linear TV has has dominated the day. But you you know, over the last handful of years. I mean, you've seen the, the the Amazons come into into play. Um, right. So yeah, it, it'll absolutely be interesting to, to see how how you know sports and entertainment are always seemingly tied at the hip um, in some form or fashion. And you know, coming out of this, it's, things could look drastically different. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because like if I take for instance, and here's the here's the difference that wasn't there say 10 or 15 years ago. I did a small little film. It's called Holiday Rush for Christmas. This last Christmas come around, it came out in November. You know, um, Netflix has 190 million viewers worldwide. So when I put that film out on Netflix, that film has that possibility of 190 million people to see it, right? right. By merely being in, in a digital environment. Right. Uh, we never had access to the globe like that. You know, and then when our numbers came in, you know, this thing was being watched, you know, in Abu Dhabi, in mm -hmm. Bangladesh, you know, all over Africa, Europe. Um, Canada, we never had access like that. So again, I think you know, with the digital digital world and this whole streaming services, you know, and it goes back to my initial premise: the idea of having a narrative. What we're doing right now, right, mm -hmm. is accessible to people that 10, 15 years ago could never have accessed this stuff. So, right. I mean, we're in a great position. See, and, and I'm I'm actually really motivated, you know, because you know we're in a we have an opportunity to do something really great here. You know, if we take the time to really look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective mm -hmm. and, and really make the, take advantage of this opportunity to make things work. No doubt, man. No, that's, that's, that's good stuff, man. I kind of want to um, want to shift gears. I, I, I hadn't looked at the clock. Um, we we, had, we have a, a, a few folks that, that have submitted questions. Um, OK. And while, while I got you, Leslie, might as well uh, kind of dig in. Um, First question we have is from uh, Alexis Foster. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring her in to to the to the room now. How you doing, Alexis? Good. How are you? I'm doing hey, well. Hey, Alexis. How are you? I'm good. Fantastic. Doing well. I appreciate. First and foremost, I appreciate you uh, s submitting the question um, and, and really being a part of this uh, this uh, conversation with us. Thank you for having me. So, so what, what you got for us? Well, I'm Alexis. I'm a first year pre-commerce student at the University of Virginia, and I've been working with athletes since high school around junior year, specifically football players. And um, I'm working towards being a sports agent. So one thing that really caught my eye about your journey following your football career was founding the Players Impact um, with business-minded pro athletes. So in my experience, I've had trouble motivating athletes at school to focus on schoolwork, careers beyond football, et cetera. So my question to you would be, what motivated you to expand your impact beyond the field? And how did you motivate other athletes to do the same? Yeah, um, for, for me, I, I, I look back and I wish I would have, you know, been able to start earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really didn't, I didn't really start to think about life after football until I was in my, my third or my fourth year in the league. And at that point, I was I was fortunate enough to have two advisors on my, my financial advisory team that uh, they were they were former NFL players themselves. So um, I kind of got a chance to see what that transition looked like to go from success on the field to success off the field. And they were really instrumental in, you know, pushing me to, to kind of expand my boundaries. Um, so. What I would say is that, um, especially in college and in younger college athletes, um, just starting to have those conversations, um, you're going you're gonna to be a little bit further ahead, ahead of the game. Um, 
you know, if, if your goal is to, to be a professional athlete, you've got to put, you know, 110% of your energy into that. Um, and even as a young professional athlete, you got to put 110% of your energy into keeping your job and, you know, staying on a roster. Um, but it's, it's really, it's, it's a long game and it's, if you can start the conversations earlier and, you know, pique the interest earlier, um, and you're not going to learn it overnight. You're not going to learn it in a year or two, but get into a place where, um, you're just continually learning and consuming more and more information. Um, you know, that's, that was kind of, you know, my journey and that's, that's what I would, that's, that's the advice that I would give any, any younger athlete. Um, you know, just consume the information as much as you can. And the ultimate goal is to become self-sufficient. Yeah. Um, when we get to a place, you know, where, where your financial advisor, you know, kind of becomes a, you know, verification of validation, you don't really need them, but, um, there, there are some, there, there is somebody that you can, you know, bounce questions off of and, you know, have real conversations about where your money is and where your money's going. And, um, that's the end game is become self-sufficient. Yeah. And, and, and let me, let me say something to that point as well, Marcus, I think one of the important things that, that, um, Alexis, is it right? Yeah. Alexis, Alexis, that you're doing is this. You know, you're planting seeds in these young guys, mm-hmm. right? And you may not see, you know, the fruition, the fruition now, right? But the idea that you're even giving them these thoughts is very important right now, right? Because as they grow and as they mature, like Marcus is saying, at some point, what you're, if you stay the course of trying to talk to them, and giving them information, they may act like they're not getting it, but at some point they're going to remember they had this conversation at some point when they need it, right? The problem is when you go into the world and no one has talked to you about it, mm-hmm. right? And you mm-hmm. have no scope. So I think there's a lot of value in what you're doing, a lot of value in what you're doing. And even if you don't see the benefit of it right now, trust me, um, the information you're planting in them is going to grow. So I say you just keep planting. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate you joining us, Alexis. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Uh, who we got next? We got a uh, we got a question from uh, from Jennifer. Let me pull Jennifer in. Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> hey, Jennifer. How are you? Fantastic. Doing, doing well. Doing well. I see, I see that who that under there. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> give this quick shout out. This is awesome what you're doing as well. So thank you for having me. Um, our, our pleasure. Our pleasure. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, what, yes. what can we, uh, what, what question you got for us tonight? Um, so I actually live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's all small businesses like restaurants, boutiques, breweries. So I was just wondering with the whole, you know, COVID-19, have to stay at home, how can these businesses market themselves where they can stand out from each other and, you know, beat the competition out? Leslie, you, you, you want, want to take I can take a shot at that. <laughs> you want me to jump into that, Marcus? Yeah, I, I can piggyback <laughs> on you. Okay. Yeah. I think that, you know, part of the, you know, again, it goes back to this discussion that this is an opportunity to be creative. Right. Um, And I think that with social media and all of these other outlets to reach out and touch, you know, it's almost like back in the old day when you seen those old movies in the 1950s and the CEO would call everybody into the office and say, we got to go door to door. Right. We have to have a personal touch. And I think that what's going to separate us is a way to utilize digital, the digital environment, social media to create a personal touch and to create a community, right? I think the other thing is, is that you have to become community friendly, right? And so in a, in a strange sense, it's pushing us back to, you know, having conversations, talking to one another. As businesses, you know, you know, I've got to reach out to you now personally and make and let you know that I'm familiar with you. I'm part of your community and your support of me helps me to support the community. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a it's an interesting time. But I also think that it's a time to become much more personal and to utilize the different tools that we have today with uh, social media and other things to make your presence known. But it, it really is now about re-envisioning. Um, how to become more personal and how to become more necessary 
in you. Uh-huh. And we and, and it and it is. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just like the restaurants I follow and stuff, you can see their marketing is so much more direct to the consumers. Um, more of the family restaurants are making like meal kits where you can dine out and like create your own meals with your kids and then the breweries are just hitting people my age like <laughs> different discounts on different days and stuff like that so it's definitely um different but it's good yeah i mean i, I think it's it's a time to to both of you guys points to to really lean into what it is that, that you do best um you know and being able to create those those one-to-one connections those those experiences and if you do have assets um uh, you know, just being able to be more creative on digital and, and um, just as an example, there, there's a, a company uh, that I own in, in Louisiana. Um, mm-hmm. Traditionally, we're, we're a cold pressed juice and smoothie uh, storefront. Um, but in most of our locations, we do have drive through access. So it allowed us to, to really pivot all, all of our business, you know, to that drive through and takeout. Um, and it's allowed us to really, you know, at least try to try to weather the storm, um, right. you know, through this through this this crisis. So, you know, the the lean into what it is that you really do best and what differentiates you in the first place. And if you do have assets, you know, that you can, you know, bring to fruition and, and you know, create those more person, those more one to one and, and uh, interactions and experiences. Um mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a way to differentiate yourself for real, for sure. Definitely. Perfect. Well, <laughs> appreciate you joining us, Jennifer, and uh, you got you got to hit that who that one time before we before we jump off. Who <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> right, appreciate it. Have a good night. Have a good Thank night. You. All right. Bye, Absolutely. guys. Bye. Yep. We're gonna pull in. Uh, we got we got Kamal, we got Kamal Roy. Kamal, what's going on, man? Kamal, can you hear us? You hear us, come on. Here it comes. Fellas, how you doing? Good. How you doing, doing sir? Doing all right, man. Not too bad at all. Leslie, nice to meet you, man. Mark, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, pre- appreciate you joining us, man. What uh, what you got for us? So um, it's a two-part question. Um, first, and, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, I've pondered on a lot and, um, I know that we've had some discussions about is just in terms of um, expansion of your brand in terms of its recognition, you know, so um, sometimes when you have a niche, you kind of stay within your market space and um, you kind of live with that market space because you find some loyalties and some connections there. But um, obviously um, we know that if you want to grow the business, um, there has to be some extension and some expansion. So we're just kind of looking for some best practices and some strategies for that. Um, which I know is a lot for the first part of the question. And um, the second part of the question is after that expansion, um, how do you, how do you continue to diversify while staying true to what your brand is? Um, I'm going to answer your first question with, with a question. Um, if, if, if you had to, to really hang your hat on, on one thing as a brand, what would it be? Um, the relationships and the training would be the one thing that I can hang the hat on. Okay. Well, I think in, in terms of, I think in terms of differentiation, if, if, if you're, if you're, um, as a brand, if, if you're really about that, that personal and that, that one-to-one interaction, um, and, and that's really at the core of your brand, I think your services are really an extension of that. Um, and I think what that allows you to do is, is if, as long as it's in your area of expertise, um, and kind of having some of that peripheral awareness that I talked about earlier, um, Mm -hmm. you're always going to be true to your brand because it's, I mean, you are your brand, you, your interaction, your energy, your passion is your brand. And I think, um, 
you know, the ability to diversify and create different service offerings are always going to have that that brand at its core. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Definitely. I would I would I would add to that um, the idea of you know expansion of platform, right? So if I'm working and my brand appeals to ten people, and I create a sense of reliability and validity in terms of what I'm doing, then if I can take that same sense of reliability and validity and and present it to now 20 people, my brand starts to grow, right? So I think at this incubation stage, at an incubation stage, the idea is to make what you're doing reliable and valid, right? And and the uh, outcomes. And then you push for bigger platforms. And in today's world, there's so many ways to access platforms because they're you know, they're here for us. So, um, but I think the bigger the biggest thing I see with a lot of young entrepreneurs is that as they grow bigger, they haven't really tested what they're doing, you know, their work product, their ethic. And so therefore it starts to fall apart. So in the incubation stage to really, really get, you know, to have your brand and what it's representing become really solid. And then it can stand, you know, being exposed at a higher level. So I think that's very important as well. I uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, it gives a good perspective. Um, and then that kind of speaks to the diversification side of it so that, so Marcus, what you're saying is at the core of your brand is where you can start to kind of build these different streams. You know, like the, the lake is mm-hmm. the big part, the, the foundation, and then you can kind of start to build these streams of different things that filter from the lake and into the lake, right? Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And, and kind of to piggyback on Leslie's point, um, if, if, if you can... If the, the, the validity and the, the work product is always at the core of what you do and the passion is always at the core of what you do, the way that you deliver that could look different. So so today it could be a one to one connection. Um, but as sure as we're sitting here on the Zoom call, you still feel that same connectivity, that same passion. And this, you know, digital platforms could be an opportunity to take what you do and, and really deliver it at scale. Um, it won't be that same one to one, but it might be, you know, a one to a few or one to a group. Um, but I think if again, if, if the core of what you do is is driven by passion and your expertise and experience, uh, I think there, there are ways to utilize different platforms and streams to really um, scale it. And I think that's going to lead you into a place where you can diversify the business model and the revenue streams. Nice. I like it. I appreciate that. No problem, man. Well, shoot, man. I pre- appreciate you joining us, man. And uh, be in touch soon. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, man. All right, man. All right. Thanks, Leslie. All right, thank you. All right. Hey, Marcus, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I had a professor once say to me, you write like I believe what you say. Right? Right. And the whole point of him was saying is that, you know, I wasn't being defensible. And I think part of the core brand building is that once you start to expand, people are going to attack, you know what I mean, and try to break down. So, right. you know, part of that is that refining so that you get to the point where it, it holds up, you know, against your protractors, you know. No, no, no doubt about it. It's, it's got to it's got to be raw clay to an extent. Um, it, it's got to it's got to stand on the principles, but it's got to be agile enough to, to take on a little water for sure. hundred yeah. percent. Yes. Uh, we got. Uh, we're gonna pull on, pull on Danielle. Hey Danielle, how you doing? She's still connecting audio. It's not there yet. It's there. Can you hear us, Danielle? Yes. Hi. How you doing? Hi, Danielle. Appreciate you joining us tonight. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So what um what how how can we help you tonight? Hi, okay, so I am from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I am in the process of growing my nonprofit called This Is Us Undefeated Survivors, which is geared towards helping those who have been sexually assaulted. So my question is we are five oh one C three. Um, my question would be how to go about finding the proper funding for it outside of grants and taking out major loans. Mm-hmm. 
Um, if if you don't mind me asking, how how have you guys um, how have you guys approached uh, fundraising to date? We haven't done so so far yet. Okay. I haven't figured out the proper steps. Like I've been doing a lot of research, but just haven't really figured out the proper steps. And then with the pandemic going on, you can't really. We're still on lockdown here, so right. we can't have no gatherings or anything. Right. You know, let me. I can step in, and this may be an indirect thing because the nonprofit is not. But I do work with a nonprofit called Healthy Babies in Washington mm-hmm. D.C. And what they do is they provide housing for uh, teenage girls that have been pregnant and abused, and so they allow them during their pregnancies to come and live there, and they provide all of their skill sets. But the young lady that runs that, uh, uh, you know, she this is her world. I, you know, part of it probably would be at this point for me. I. You know, offline, I can send an email or something, but I can definitely connect you with the director of that program because she spends the majority of her time raising money for her nonprofit. So part of it sometimes is not knowing the answer, but knowing where to get it. And, uh, Correct. you know, um, I could definitely, you know, you know, send out an email to Marcus, whatever, and, and connect you to because she's very collaborative in that way. Uh, because her goal is to see women empowered and those that are being abused to have some place of refuge. And I think that work is, is, is necessary, especially, you know, um, throughout this country. So, yes, I mean, I think yes. collaborating with the right people. That would be amazing because that is my my ultimate goal in the long run is to offer for those who have been abused to offer them somewhere to stay if they don't have anywhere to stay Um Pretty much our goal is to help them start over with Mm -hmm. the counseling. If you dropped out of school, we're going to help you get your GED. And then we're going to go into job training. And if you need somewhere to lay your head, my ultimate goal is to have that place where you can sleep. And my nonprofit is, it's to me, it's my baby because I was once a victim. Um, And although I didn't, turn to the streets, but it was a struggle. I did make decisions in my life that I shouldn't have made. Mm-hmm. So this is something I've prayed on and I know that this is my purpose. And so my biggest hurdle now is getting the funding right. and raising the funding so that we can go ahead and start this process and help those who need it. I mean, I, the, the thing the thing that I would I would suggest is as as you're as you're building this out, I think I, you can kind of you can kind of feel your passion and how connected you are to to the mission itself. Um, and I think in conversations with with anyone around fundraising, I think that that's going to connect and that's going to show through. Um, I would say my background. Um, it, it, I've spent a, a, a ton of time in in. Um, venture capital and working with startups and it might not seem connected but if if you can kind of treat um your organization like a company like you you're almost you're asking for for seed money like it's an investment and i think the ability to to kind of build out the vision on paper and present the vision to to the right people um you know kind of building building a list of um, companies and individuals that you know are connected to your cause, um, you know, really taking the time to build build out almost your, your business model and your, your almost your pitch deck um, and be able to, to tie the, the business plan with your passion and being able to pitch it in a way that people can see that you're passionate about it. They can see the direction that you want to take it and they can also see, you know, if I if I give you dollars, I can see the impact that these dollars will have, and I can see you know how these dollars are going to be spent. <clears throat> I think the ability to kind of lay it out with that mentality on the back end, um, it's going to allow it's going to allow you to articulate it to, to folks, and it's going to allow them to receive it in a way that um, anyone that that cuts a check, whether it's an investment or it's a donation, they want to be connected to you know. The, the return on that money and, and in this situation the return is a, is an impact um, yes. so the more that you can kind of draw the line from you know starting point to to that impact I think it's going to help you it's, it's going to help you connect you know with folks in, in a greater way 
Thank you. No problem. Perfect. Oh well. Um. Yeah, Leslie. If if, if you shoot me that contact, I can I can definitely shoot yeah, it over yeah, to you, Danielle. I'll definitely sure. shoot that too. And I think that's a great mm-hmm. place to start because she's been doing it for like twenty years. So yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, awesome. that would be amazing. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, appreciate right, you joining well, us, Danielle. Thank you so much, Mr. Leslie, and thank you, Marcus. Absolutely. No, no yeah, problem. Yeah. Have a good night. You as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Last man we got, we got uh, we pull uh, Moody in. Okay. We got uh, we pull uh, Moody. Moody, how you doing, man? Hey, how's it going? Hey, Moody. Can't, can't complain. Appreciate you joining us, man. Closing out the show with us. Yeah. How you guys doing? You guys holding up strong? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Get, getting hammered. <laughs> <laughs> No, we might, no. might, might uh, enjoy Cinco de Mayo after this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds yeah. good. Yeah, um, well, yeah, I, um, so yeah, my name is Moody. Um, I'm uh, the CEO of a company called Brand XR, and uh, we're an early stage technology company um, focused on uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and so we've been building these experiences kind of for the for the past three three years, um, and and as we've been building them, we're figuring out that it's, it's way too hard to build these experiences, uh, and so we're building a, a platform uh, called the Brand XR Studio to make it uh, very easy for people to build these experiences. So it's a no code, um, so it's making it accessible for really everyone uh, that doesn't know how to code to be able to build these experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what, what what we've been working on, and I was, I'm, we've been bootstrapped. Um, you know, we've been um, kind of working with different brands to um, do custom AR VR projects for them, and that's what's been keeping the, the lights on for us. Um, as we've been building out our, our technology software uh, platform, and so I'm curious. Uh, we're about to like enter the the fundraising stage, and I'm curious how. Um, one, like how we can reach out to, you know, folks like you guys who, um, are angel investors, um, and specifically like, what do you guys look for in the early stage technology companies? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say from from a personal standpoint, um, the, 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 the biggest driver for, for me, um, as an investor is a company that, you know, I have to kind of, I have to get the technology. Um, but I also have to really understand how, how I can add value. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is, um, as you guys are, 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 you know, going through these, uh, you, you guys are beta testing with, with groups now. Mm -hmm. Are you, Mm -hmm. are you, uh, working with, um, any particular industries? Do you have a focus within particular yeah, industries? Yeah, we're focused on um, like uh, marketing agencies, like larger marketing agencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people who have already built uh, AR and VR experiences, mm-hmm. uh, and then also larger enterprises um, who have built AR VR experiences. Mm-hmm. And these are people who have like quote unquote felt the pain of how right. hard it is to build these experiences. Um, so if we can, we're thinking if we can give them a tool where it's like 10 times easier um, and, and, and also new people can, can build these experiences. So like people who don't know how to code mm-hmm. um, kind of like more creative people um, then, you know, that, that, that'd be a valuable tool for them. Got it. Um, I mean, if, if it's truly kind of a, is, is it, like a, a platform as a service type of type of a, a company or is it software as a service? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, it's similar to like a Shopify or Got like it. a Squarespace. Got it. Um, you know, like a monthly, uh, software subscription. Gotcha. Um, I know the, if you guys are reaching out to, to digital agencies, um, and I'm assuming it's, it's on the, the, the agencies that are really in the experiential marketing game. Yep. Um, yep potentially looking at some industries that 
um, this could be kind of a cutting edge deployment, um, you know, of AR, VR. Um, so an industry that comes to mind would be like real estate. <clears throat> um, uh, industry that's probably not overly technical, but if you guys are providing the technical back end in, you know, white glove fashion that, you know, is really easy to use, does it allow an industry like that to, to really um, utilize the technology in a different way and kind of separate you guys and, you know, give you another industry to kind of hang your hat on? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You know, and, and if I could chime in, you know, because I'm I work in, you know, production, but when I think about AR and VR and the current climate that we're in, yeah. you know, uh, one of the things people are struggling with is education and how to educate their kids, right? And with uh, AR, you know, you know, creating scenarios where kids can utilize them for learning, to me, it would be a bonanza, right? Because part of it is, is that, you know, you can throw a model right on a kid's floor with AR, you know what I mean, of a building, you know, with dimensions and all that kind of stuff. If they're into architecture or if there's some mathematical formula that they need to do and create a parabola with that formula. Like there's so many applications for that in the education world that I think by using education and then your investors become government agencies, education agencies, and those kind of places, because we need new methodologies for education, especially in this environment. So I would imagine that, that there is a tremendous gain in that environment. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the areas where, uh, you know, especially after, you know, the, the pandemic, you know, that that's one of the online education is one of the areas we're, we're definitely focusing in on. Um, so, yes, uh, I mean, to me, when I think about AR, that to me is one of uh, it is such a big marketplace because I know everybody I talk to right now is struggling with, you know, how are they going to keep their kids educated, keep them up to par? You know, kids are getting restless just looking at a computer screen. And to me, AR, a breakthrough with AR to, to take lessons and modeling, especially in the sciences and mathematics, uh, to me, it's just like uh, with games mm -hmm. in that environment would be such a huge, I mean, I would be excited about getting involved with something like that, only because there's such a demand. And as this thing goes forward, it's going to stay. The demand is not going to decrease, right? right. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's an area that, you know, to me, um, and there's just, just tremendous amounts of funding out there for that kind of thing. Okay. And it, I guess, how would you recommend uh, approaching the, uh, the schools and like the educational industry with, uh, with something uh, like me, that? I would come up with, with prototypes, you know what I mean? I would take, whether it's in math, whether it's in, you know, biology, whatever, I would take prototypes and come up with learning modules that come, that, you know, you could utilize. And then it becomes examples. I mean, this is one of those things where you walk and say, look, I can put on that floor right there in front of you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This model, and that can be transmitted with whatever, da 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 da, da. But, and then I would go to, you know, I would start at the, you know, at the, at the, at the, um, at the board of supervisors. But I, to me, it was put together those models, giving those tools to teachers, giving those tools to schools, and the fact that you're saying you're working where you don't have to do code. Right. Um, yep. You know, the adaptation would be very easy. And part of the, you know, in, in our industries, when you make adaptation a smooth process, right, people don't have to learn a lot in order to access what you're doing, it becomes useful very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious on, on your end, Marcus, like how, how, you know, uh, we saw one thing recently was like a, a Travis Scott concert in mm -hmm. Fortnite. <clears throat> Uh, um, and so, you know, like kind of seeing music coming into the gaming world. Um, and so I'm curious on your side, like how, how you're seeing like entertainment now in this like you know, post COVID-19 world. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's going to continue to, to innovate. Um, you know, I think this, um, the emergence of, of esports over the last couple of years is is I think it's it's in a really interesting position to continue to accelerate. Um, I think <clears throat> I think you're going to start to see more um, 
like solutions like like yours. I mean, AR and VR has has kind of been a part of the sports and entertainment world for a while. Um, you know, as we kind of figure out what live sports is going to look like moving forward, I think you can see a shift into you know deploying more um, technology um, to really activate brands, activate sponsors, and, and experiences. Um, and to me, I said it earlier, uh, sports, music, entertainment, it's all tied at the hip. I think when you see innovations in one area, um, it's not going to be too far off before you see it in all those other areas. So, um, you know, what you're seeing in, in the music space right now, um, I think, you know, will, will be adopted into in the sports. Um, and once you get brands, you know, kind of in the mix that are powering, you know, these experiences and these technologies, um, it could it could look, you know, very, very different, differently over the next, you know, couple of years when it when it comes to those types of activations. Yeah. It's super exciting. Very exciting to see like kind of where where things are going. It's <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> No, for, for sure. And, and, and I think coming out of this, I mean, the, the need for that personal connectivity and those personal touch points, um, the, the, the way that you scale that is through technology. And, and I mean, a company like yours, you know, seemingly is, is positioned really well to, to make that, that jump and that adaptation to Leslie's point, um, you know, so much simpler for folks so that, um, they can always they can continue to do what they do best, which is you know put together experiences, to, uh, you know deploy content, um, and you kind of give them give them the engine to do it in, in dynamic and, and innovative ways. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. No problem, man. Thank you. Well, I appreciate appreciate you appreciate you joining us tonight, man, and and uh, wrapping up the show with us. Yes, sir. All right. All right. You guys have a good night. All right, man. You too, man. All right. Uh, Bye-bye. Perfect, man. That was a good one. No, no no doubt about it, man. Um, Well, shoot, man. I I appreciate you. Appreciate you kicking this off with me, man. It's... um, been 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 good to talk with you, man. And, uh, you know... Every time I talk to you, I, I, I take take away a couple of jewels, and um, you know, it's just always good to connect, man, for sure. Yeah, no, no, I'm uh, you're a breath of fresh air, and your articulation of this environment uh, is impressive. So I'm, yes, this is wonderful, absolutely. Nah, so I'm, I'm gonna make sure I sign you up for 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 another go around here soon. Let's go. <laughs> yep, and as soon as they loosen these things up, I'm on that East Coast. You know, we, we got to connect in person. Nah, we're gonna make it happen, man. Yes, sir. All right, man. Well, I appreciate every everyone that uh, that tuned in. Um, and hope uh, hopefully you guys, um, you know, got 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 a little value out of this conversation, and uh, got a feeling that we we're gonna be seeing more more of these types of conversations. So, um, if you get a chance, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, follow me on on uh, all the social uh, platforms, and uh, talk to you guys soon. All right. Peace. All right, man. Peace.